welcome to Go With The Heat. I'm Dominic. And I'm John. And I'm Jenna. And this is your cultural guide to the phenomenon that was Miami Vice. I have to say, guys, I missed saying that last week. Felt I felt different not having an episode last week. I felt great. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me rephrase that. That sounds insensitive. I felt awesome. <laughs> the the Cubs won the World Series. And I was busy in Chicago, so Mm. uh, on the ground with all of those glorious, glorious Cubs fans. Well, this week, we are taking a break from our normal episode rundown before we get started on season two. And we're going to be going through recaps of our favorite stuff that was from season one of Miami Vice. This week, we're going to be specifically talking about our favorite people and music from the first season. We have a lot to get through. So there's, there's, there's a lot of people that made guest appearances season one. We have our routine people that made appearances we also have our regular vice teams so we have a lot of information to cover here true we should start with the with the core group let's start with our core miami vice team right from the beginning i think we were all pretty much in love with our main crime fighting duo tubbs and crockett yeah Yeah, i I think that their pairing is what's just perfect I mean, it's the ebony and ivory of TV. <laughs> <laughs> Jenna, I know early on in season one, you had quite the, there was quite the glow around Crockett. And... <laughs> that Crockett, he's so dreamy. <laughs> <laughs> and we had some, there was some changes in the very beginning. So we have, we have our core duo. We have Crockett and Tubbs. And then there's the B team, of course, Ms. Whitek and Zito, the ladies, Gina and Trudy. And then in the beginning, we had... Lieutenant Rodriguez was was the lieutenant of, of the team. How much do we miss him, guys? Who? <laughs> <laughs> I have to say, uh, I'm not I normally think... receptive to changes like this. I know that early on in Law in Law and Order, when they that they killed off one of the officers, I was heartbroken. I was ready to give up on that show just because of that. And, and you know, and because of who it was, if, if I remember correctly, wasn't Lieutenant Rodriguez Greg Sierra? Oh, oh, I'm thinking of Crockett's former partner. Oh, Oh, yeah, yeah. 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 Jimmy Schmitz. (laughs) Jimmy Schmidt. Let's let's pour one out for Jimmy Spitz because he lasted a whole three minutes until they blew up a body double that looked just like him. I mean, his wife in the show had a longer run than he did. (laughs) It's tough, man. I I mean, I I wonder what Miami Vice could have been with Jimmy Schmidt. True. And it's the same thing with with Rodriguez. You know, if if I think about it, without the switch to Castillo, although I feel like he's underutilized in the first season that Castillo was, but we have a part episode that's just about Castillo. I'll tell you what, we weren't going to see Greg Sierra out in that black Speedo. So (laughs) I think we got a clear upgrade. Greg Sierra doesn't know how to do some sort of Thai Kung Fu. True, true. And in the hit list, they do a great job of killing Lieutenant Rodriguez, who had voiced saying that he didn't want to be on Miami Vice anymore. So I think, I think even though he put up a fight, he was still, they still did him right by how they, by how they killed him. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, they could have made it just absolutely ridiculous. I have I, I think they did a by Elvis good... or something. Yes. Okay. Well, that would have been a lot better, but <laughs> you throw out the <laughs> one winning idea. Okay. <laughs> what are your guys' thoughts on since Cash? Castillo has become the lieutenant. Like, do you think the addition of Mark of Mar- Marty Castillo has been a benefit for for the show? He fits, I think, the type of police chief that they need. But I've always kind of got this feeling with him being the guy, you know, w- with the suit and everything. Always felt like 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 an FBI agent, or like every time I see him, I think of the John Travolta guys from Pulp Fiction. You know, for some reason. So I don't know. It's just just that just the suit and just the no nonsenseness. Like I feel like he's good for the show, uh, and I, I love think Edward he's too James. Quiet. Like, I realize that the Castillo stare is a total thing, but it's super creepy. With the amount like... of, I guess where I was going is with the amount of comedy that they try and incorporate in the show, I fully expected the police chief to be more of standard cop police chief yelling at the detectives, you know, like a lethal weapon style police chief. And that's exactly what I liked about Lieutenant Rodriguez, even though he was in there for such a short time. He fit that role. He was the, you know, that over the top 80s. I'm going to yell at you every time you come into 
my office even if you did nothing wrong kind of lieutenant yeah so i do i i do miss that i think that ultimately that would have been the better way to go then like i'm almost i sometimes wonder if marty comes in drunk every day because <laughs> he gets that look right where he's just kind of like head tilted looking at you from above the eye like <laughs> i don't know he weirds me out not to mention that can we just say it like he hates women he clearly hates women He's yeah. constantly <laughs> demeaning the women on the staff and not, like taking work away from them. But he's also really good for Crockett. He is the the yang to Crockett's yin, where Crockett's just he's a free wheel and shoot from the hip, do everything by feel. And Castillo is that voice of reason, like, look, we are police officers. We have protocol, people have rights. You need to do things the right way. So he reigns in Crockett when needed. Yes, very true. But they always but the thing that I have found strange with Castillo that I kinda like but i kind of don't like is this shroud of mystery that they keep behind him when we got the two-part episode and we found out he's a ninja uh, who only <laughs> eats at thai places you know <laughs> it, it was incredibly interesting from a viewer perspective but at the same time it raised a lot of questions of, for me exactly i mean is he this kind of secret agent spy dude and what did he do to get busted down to babysitting a group a group of vice cops now on the flip side though what the what these vice cops have been taking care of in miami it makes it look like miami is like a war zone like they need someone like castillo to be there because people are armed with like in the in, not in the in the great mccarthy but in the um in no exit where they're buying rocket launchers and they have the message that they might be able to shoot down an airplane you know like <laughs> it, what the hell was going on in miami what what <laughs> weren't the vice team up to in the 80s <laughs> <laughs> anyway i think when you you're talking so you're talking about how castillo is a good balance for for crockett like he gives him but i feel like tubbs is that like tubbs is the i'm gonna give you the leash but still be your conscience like he plays that role so well and admittedly we've been very harsh on tubbs and but have grown to appreciate him especially for being the phenomenal cop he's like really the only actually good other than trudy like the only actually good cop on the show but i feel like he fills that for me for crockett where like i trust that crockett's not gonna get too out of hand someone's gonna be like hey this is we're not off in some other place where you can just run free like that like you do need to pull it in at some point crockett's always been that for me with his long side glances in the middle of the night. <laughs> Very true. And that's, I mean, we talked about that in the beginning. Like we were unsure of what Tubbs actually brought to this, that it was going to be, that wasn't Miami Vice. It was the Sonny Crockett show with Tubbs, right? And then it slowly morphed into that there was this balance between the two of them. And it actually, and in a lot of cases, it seems like Sonny is too emotional to be a vice cop that Tubbs has to check him on a routine basis. Yeah. So not to divert the topic, but speaking of the ladies of vice, um, <laughs> I have a question for you. I often make Make jokes about their lack of involvement um but that's typical of 80s tv shows what would you have thought of maybe say pam greer one of our guest stars had she been a permanent member of the vice in one of the true in like the trudy role what if they brought in a big name actress well i play think I think that's what our our frustration is with the with the ladies of the of the vice team. It was kind of the same thing with Tubbs that, like you're saying, like we you in particular, but all of us were kind of down on the ladies in the beginning. But so they slowly morphed into a good, solid team for the vice, and and we changed on Tubbs the same way. In the beginning, we were kind of hard on Tubbs, and by the end, like we really loved Tubbs. The base episode aside, but. After that, when it came to when Crockett was dealing with his with his stuff in Evan, and when you know the, as he grew with Crockett, and you and it, the same thing in the one with the two kids who were trying to buy drugs in Colombia, that the they, milk run, yeah, the milk run, that they are good friends and Tubbs is really taken and we we really grew on Tubbs and I think it was the same thing with the ladies and our frustration with the ladies that were constantly let down that they're not allowed mm -hmm. to go out and be better cops that yeah. if the writers could get out of the way they would so that's yeah so I, I just your, feel like I just feel like so to your question I think that Pam Greer like that would have been cool but it wasn't that the 
actresses that they had weren't enough. Like, if actually, if anything, I think adding a Pam Greer would have been like too much because Don Johnson and PMT were already like big personalities mm-hmm. that you can even see like as they focused more on the B team and uh, and other sort of side stories that it's like a weird distraction that I think it would have just been like a weird dynamic to have someone who's that much of a powerhouse or a strong woman on the show. But I was so when we started, I was so amped on the women that like they seem like super independent and super strong and great cops and like like you started that opening episode where Crockett and Gina are arguing in the bathroom and there's birth control behind them and it's just like she's being you know she's not falling for his crap and like that totally eroded for me throughout mm-hmm. the rest of the they were involved less and less did more and more of just the administrative gina became the lovesick puppy that gets tossed aside you know like that it was so there were so many great opportunities that it felt like they were starting really strong that for me the ladies was like a huge disappointment watching the Pam Greer episode and seeing how different her character was to me as far as the strength behind it and maybe it is the writing I feel like there were very few if any scenes where I watched Gina or Trudy and I felt had the same magnitude of just Pam Greer's guest appearance I look at Mm -hmm. the current trend of cop procedural shows these days and it has become almost a staple to have that big name female actress, even if it's only a temporary role throughout a single season. I mean, it, example being like The Shield when they brought in Glenn Close. So I think that it, it's become something where it, you have to have a, a bigger name female or a more involved female actress in current cop procedurals. And I just wonder how that dynamic would have worked back then. True. And I think that what me and Jenna are getting to too is that like maybe Gina and Trudy could have been that if the vice would if my vice would have just got out of their way and let them become their own because we have a bunch of scenes where like in the beginning of an episode where Trudy is pretending to be a junkie in in the beginning of the little prince where she's pretending to be a junkie and then they go into the house like the ladies are a good police team it's just it's almost like the writers just couldn't get out of the way yeah absolutely as we've grown to love people and we've grown with the ladies and 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 we see the the benefit that that they give although right now it's only seem to be the ones that can use a card catalog and be able to look stuff up on the computer we have our duo and tubs has started to grow with us but you know every once in a while we need just that comic relief and the b team it took us almost to the very end of the season to finally come around on them and up until the episode made for each other what was just about them is when we finally came around on Zito and Switek. You know, I think I really was just, I needed them to just be honest about Stan and Larry. And once <laughs> they finally were, and they could be free in their relationship, then I could come around to it. It just adds so much for me. I think if we're honest, I mean, especially in TV standards, Zito and Switek started out as throwaway characters, as people to feed lines in to keep the stars going. As the show built, they got their own, they carved their own niche out to the point where they couldn't get rid of them. Because they're pretty consistently, when the show gets too serious, in comes Zito and Switek to kind of bring it back down. Yeah, kind of a bring in the clowns approach. <laughs> yeah. I know that, Jenna, you're paying extra close attention to what's happening between those two. I will say that I think Switek made the the larger case for himself to be necessary on the show. I still very much feel like Zito is replaceable. Like he, So he had his moment in Made for Each Other where, you know, he's on hard times and like you feel for him with his fish and his house. But I still feel like Switek for me was the character I came around on the most. Um, he's the most goofball, right? He he loves Elvis. He did his stand up routine in one of the episodes. I mean, he he's definitely he throws caution to the wind, unlike Zito, who's just in constant awe of swipe tech right when you think over the course of the season so we can pinpoint multiple scenes where swipe tech was the slapstick guy and the comedy guy even when the b team are together you expect the majority effort to be coming from swipe tech like he's going to be the one doing the most outrageous things right whereas you don't yeah, really was the leader that. He's and still a quiet character uh, for me replaceable is what i'm getting at <laughs> yeah Ahem, ahem, season two uh 20 years ago <laughs> <laughs> so we have th- three teams on the vice team right we have we have our crime fighting duo we have the b team we have the ladies but there's a secret 
fourth Vice team. That is a necessary part of Miami Vice, and we cannot imagine the season without these two. I am talking, of course, about the Nook Man and Izzy Moreno. Noogie. <laughs> Noogie. Probably so, our two favorite characters so far on the show. I'm At least strongly- for me. I'm strongly considering the future children that I have to be Nougat Neville Lamont. <laughs> <laughs> and Isidore Moreno. And I am Isidore wondering Moreno. why there was never, I am wondering why there's, there was never a spinoff with those two characters and why we are not watching that shit instead. So before we get too far into this, let's take a look back at season four when in the episode titled Cool Running when Charlie Barnett or who played the Nook Man first made his appearance. So I'm a, let's let's play a clip, John, of when you did a good explainer on who Charlie Barnett is. You got a little information about the Nug Man. So yeah, I did want to bring it up. The Nug Man, uh, whose actual name is Charlie Barnett. Charlie Barnett was a comedian back in that t- time frame, and kind of his claim to fame was that he was almost famous. He actually was auditioned by a Saturday Night Live and. And he actually, he almost got the part. He he ended up skipping his final audition because he, uh, from, uh, according to Wikipedia, he was self-conscious over some stuff. And the part ended up going to Eddie Murphy. That's so, crazy. I mean, that's... So right there, you know, there's, he was one audition. That's just a crazy scenario. Like, yeah, exactly. About exactly. That. You know, he was one audition away from being Eddie Murphy or having that career path in front of yeah. him, you know? And so the other thing that caught my attention is that dave chappelle has said has publicly said that charlie barnett was an influence of his because charlie barnett did do a little bit of def jam circuit at the very beginning of def jam comedy jam and so dave should have said and i think you can kind of see that when you look at the character of noogie and you look at some of dave chappelle's characters in his skits i think you can see where he kind of takes that influence yeah. So, but the thing is, is that Charlie Burnett actually died tragically. He contracted HIV through heroin use, and he actually passed away in 1996. And Dave Chappelle had talked about in interviews that he had he had explored at one point in time trying to do biopic pick of Charlie Burnett. I mean, that's crazy. That's crazy about about the Nook Man and, and his background. So the Nook Man, he has been so great throughout this season and every time he's on camera i am locked to what's happening on the screen yeah he's like the vibe that he gets going where i feel like i could just watch him riff on camera all day so i feel like every time i watch a movie or a tv show i feel like i am upping and i'm seeing little bits of charlie barnett in characters now you know I feel like I, I, I see all of this influence that I didn't see before. And man, I just wish we could have gotten more stuff out of him when he was alive. And what's telling is that, you know, he he seems like he's always on, right? And he, he's able to drop one, great one-liners. He makes fun of the B team constantly. But we also saw a brief moment of him in Made for Each Other where he let it down, where he was getting frustrated with always being taken advantage of the B team. I mean, by the Vice team. Nuki is a multi-layered character too where he wants he wants to make his money but he wants to help the vice team he's he he loves to put on a show as the character of nookie but the real character nookie he's not that way and i i hope that later we see maybe we see a little bit more behind the scenes although it's hard to make up for all the times we've seen him like in his house taking a quote-unquote vacation with a hair dryer over his head and pretending to play the guitar <laughs> mm-hmm. i feel like charlie barnett is one of the the original guys who could just walk on set and just rap. I yeah. didn't need a script. You could just say, "Charlie, do your thing," you yeah. know, and he'd be funny. Yeah. And the the other side of that coin of that of this coin is Izzy Moreno, and we first met him in episode nine, The Great McCarthy. So it wasn't until late. Now, don't forget. Well, well, we first we, saw we, him in the in is it the pilot right as Trini DeSoto, our yes. cross dressing man of mystery. <laughs> yes, Martin Fereno has been here all along. I am yeah. convinced he is in every scene. We just don't know it. <laughs> 
John, I know you have some backstory on Martin Ferrero. Why don't you give us a rundown? Because we have a great explainer from you about Charlie Barnett. How about you give us some history on the myth, the man, the myth, the legend that's behind Izzy Moreno? So I am calling this segment Martin Ferrero, America's most forgotten actor. <laughs> uh, Martin Marty, as he likes to be called is pretty much king of the bit parts if you look at his filmography he's in a lot of a lot of movies that you would recognize and a lot of tv shows you'd recognize typically playing these bit parts and to give you a few examples he was in planes trains and automobiles did you guys know that no how he you're plays, right how? he really does he just played, sneak in doesn't he he plays the second motel clerk damn okay so, good thing that's a thanksgiving movie because that's so i'm gonna be watching that movie anyway now i'm gonna be looking for him yeah so he was in Jurassic Park. I yep. think that's a little bit more we know we know him from because he's the lawyer that gets eaten on the toilet. So yep, yep. that seems to be a memorable scene from that movie. <laughs> but he was in the movie Heat. <laughs> yeah, he played the construction clerk in the movie Heat, which I actually do vaguely remember that scene near the beginning. So I think you're right, John. Like you can probably just start listing off movies. He's like, yep, he's guy number seven in the window. Yep, he's in that one too. Exactly. You know, just start naming exactly. everything. And it's not just TV shows. He was Wounded Man in Jeep in an episode of MASH. <laughs> uh, he was also Shooter in an episode of The X-Files. So, I mean, like, you could pretty much look up and down his resume. He is a ton of stuff that you know that you never realized he was in. What's great? Was, was Shooter a recurring role? <laughs> <laughs> what's great I hope not. is that their roles that are like, like he could have just been walking by and then but because you recognize him they had to put him in the credits he's just like he's got yes. a sandwich in his like huh <laughs> <laughs> they have to put him in, the, in the credits for the show <laughs> I mean, let's be real though. Like with the X Files, the X Files was known for its like pretty blank statement people. Like the Smoking Man was known as the Smoking Man for the entire the entire show. So like Shooter could have been, might have been Shooter could have been like one of the most important characters. <laughs> so yeah, Marty's uh, Marty has played a ton of bit roles. So why do I think he's the, the greatest american actor to be forgotten well i'm gonna let marty tell it himself these are quotes uh from facebook posts off of marty ferreira's facebook yes the internet does so, nothing but give us gifts you guys okay let, let, let me preface this with the fact that these are all posted by marty himself or at least someone he employs um <laughs> So, Come on, they're definitely by him. He let's doesn't start. have the, the, the budget to employ other people. Let, let, let's start with the, his take on the Miami Vice. He wrote, Marty as legendary Izzy Moreno on Miami Vice, known for his wild ad-libs and humor and humor-injected grants, Marty soon became a stalwart of the show, even outshining <laughs> the stars themselves. <laughs> And he, he he added, then he added a quote from Don Johnson. Don Johnson saying, "quote A true professional, the seventh wonder of acting of the <laughs> acting world. Why the f isn't Ferrero doing more pictures? Why does it sound like this is what he sends to studios to try and get work? Like this is his resume, <laughs> and this is what he's posting on his Facebook. I would imagine he has many skeptical people finding his Facebook." <laughs> He needs to defend himself. Uh, so, while he was recording his bit part in the movie Get Shorty, the 1995 John Travolta movie, he mentions Elmore Leonard, the writer of the actual novel, uh, said of Marty, Had I known Marty would bring such life to a bit part character, I would have gone back to my original manuscript <laughs> and changed Chili Palmer's name to Marty Effing Ferreira. <laughs> I mean, if that's not enough proof that he's the greatest forgotten actor ever, um, I will include when he was a guest star. He was just on set. He has to. He has to tell people, remind people, like, no, wait, I was in that movie. Don't forget, I was the guy in the background eating the sandwich. Like, don't forget about yes. me, Marty Ferrero, greatest yes. shooter in the world. 
revolutionized and the ski so, mask game. <laughs> it would make complete sense that his guest appearance on Hill Street Blues made star Michael Warren say Marty was always a step ahead of us. We'd go <laughs> left, he'd veer right. We'd stay on course, he'd pave a new road entirely. <laughs> So, uh, uh, Marty Ferrero, innovator, seventh wonder of the acting world, bit part performer, and stage actor. Oh, wow. Man. I, I mean, so much, I... it sounds like he wrote it himself, right? And then he just asked oh, him, like, can I, I yes. say, can I, can I put this in your name? Like, yeah, whatever, bro. Yeah, go for so, it. so, you know, when you're like, <laughs> applying, when you're like applying for college, just to let you know, you know, when you're applying for college and you have to like, write out like letters of recommendation but mm -hmm. most of the teachers are like yeah, yeah yeah just write something and like i'll sign it so like just send me whatever you <laughs> yeah. write and i'll sign it i would imagine that it's roughly the same way that martin ferrero is just sitting at his <laughs> in front of his like his super old like original at, like macintosh computer <laughs> yeah. like his typewriter just mailing Got these the out asking for is. people to sign them off <laughs> so so just, and just to let you know i did not do ex extensive research where i dove in this facebook post way back those were literally the last three facebook <laughs> posts he made they were the first three things i read and i just wrote them down that was it that was the extent of my research so <laughs> so what makes izzy what we thought made Izzy unique when we first met him in episode nine was that he played another character in the very beginning of the season in Trini DeSoto. But as we watched season one through its whole course, we found out that a character, an actor playing two characters in Miami Vice is nothing unique. Oh, yeah. This show was practically the motto of get you someone who can do both. OK, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if it was just that they are like the budget conscious show of the 80s or what, but um, Miguel or Martin Ferrero was by far not the only one. So we had a number of other people. Now, mind you, the majority of the actors that we saw in season one, which, as we all know, uh, and we'll later talk more about, was just chock full of guest stars. We see most of them again as other characters in seasons two and beyond. But even for just season one, we had Miguel Pinero, who played Calderon, and he played Radia, and he was also a writer on Smuggler's Blues. So they really got the most out of that contract. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, did he also wash the cars? Or <laughs> <laughs> right. Let's see. We've also got Bill Smitrovich, who was Scotty Wheeler, and DEA agent Burr. For those of us who are keeping track of side characters who barely got a name. <laughs> Martin Ferrero's keeping track of every time, every little appearance he's made. <laughs> so I'm sure Smitrovich or whatever his last name is, is keeping track as well. And we also had <laughs> Koti Mundi, who was Ramon in No Exit. He also played Tucker Smith in Smuggler's Blues. And we see him as additional characters in later seasons. So, you know, props to the to the Miami Vice casting director who really was just he was meeting that bottom line. Oh, the always, as you've mentioned before, Jenna, the always budget conscious Miami Vice writers. It makes me feel like they were just trying to save their budgets to make sure that they can make crime story happen. Right. I mean, no one was doing a better job of that except for maybe the set. The, the location scout who <laughs> and I think like Arguably talk about just how big he uh, constantly. I, I think we also we talk about the big name superstars but most of them were just starting their acting careers so they're even budget conscious with their with their guest stars I mean they didn't even get the best eagle <laughs> 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 well, that's a perfect time for us to move over and start talking about our favorite guest stars that have appeared in season one, other than our main vice characters, who we'll continue to see for the rest of the show, just like our C team, I guess you could call them, with Izzy and Nookie. But that was, this season was chock full of who either at the time or in the future became great 
A-list actors, and this is where they got their start, or like in some cases, like Pam Greer, came out of nowhere, a big-time celebrity on the show. So rather than going through this one at a time, we had we figured we'd have a little bit of fun, because we've gone into detail in all of the individual episodes where these celebrities appeared, gone into more detail about who they are and what and what, what, what where they came from, what they ended up going on doing, and how they either they got their start on Miami Vice or what they were doing before they came on Miami Vice. They figured we'd take a look at the characters that appeared and the celebrities that were playing them in season one and and play some what if scenarios there are season one superlatives <laughs> all right so let's start off with an easy one because you know we we have many gangsters in miami vice so who would be the person that you would want to pick if you were casting a mob movie who is the person that you pick jenna who of our mobsters that we met in season one tony amato our boy hmm. buck buck <laughs> 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 not only was he just phenomenal and that whole episode of music statement was my favorite um <laughs> but he plays a real badass like a convincing badass like there's a reason why our boy bruce made it into the Die Hard movies and on to uh other such fame absolutely and he was he was scary in that episode right yeah he was just unhinged john are you gonna go the easy route or, or you, you, you're gonna pick uh, someone a little deeper cut in there. That, that's that's what I'm struggling with. Is my heart wants to go with John Turturro, but mm. common sense just says Dennis Farina. I mean, Dennis Farina is Italian mobster. Like everything he's ever done, he's Italian mobster or Italian cop. And they made him um, super but John Turturro did they made him a super stereotype in the last in the last episode Lombard. They made him like a hardcore Italian stereotype. Yeah, yeah. And so, and I mean, that's why I said like common sense wants me to pick Dennis Farina because he's clearly the the most comfortable or the most believable mobster of the bunch. But John Turturro did such a good job in his guest appearance. I almost want to say him. But well, that's okay, John. <laughs> You're gonna have another opportunity where I think John Turturro is gonna be the right person to choose <laughs> i would say okay. if i'm picking who i want to lead my be the lead actor in my mob movie i'm gonna choose burt young who appeared in the give a little take a little episode as the creepy drug mobster who ends up ruining Ooh, our Uncle burt yeah uncle bert he was so creepy in that role and he was he 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 hit it on the head for me on how on how i want my creepy mobster to be and D dennis freena gives you more of like more of like a godfather feel right where he you feel like that even though he does bad mm -hmm. things you're still on his team where i'm against uncle paulie all the way so let's yeah, move on to, i let's, see that let's go to our next question john I, I'll, I'll have you lead off with this one which character or which guest star is in there with when, when you first met them was be most likely to fly off the handle and probably pistol whip you <laughs> <laughs> i feel like you're in danger of being pistol whipped or having your ear cut off anytime michael madsen is anywhere mm. in the vicinity oh, good one i just I, I i just i see every time i see him i just picture him dancing around with a gas can and i get scared <laughs> <laughs> that's a good one and you know, I, it's hard for me to decide on this, but I think I would say Isai Morales, who was in the Home Invaders, because they're just, he's just unhinged enough in that episode. I think that there's nothing you can do to stop it. He's just going to do it to you anyway, regardless of who you are. I don't know, you guys. I got to be honest here. I think, my, I think I'm going to win with mine because there's no way that you are not constantly worried that she's not going to take any of your bullshit, okay? I'm for sure that Pam Greer would would pistol whip someone <laughs> <laughs> she, she was not she wasn't there for any of their bullshit so i think when she's 90 she's she'll still pistol whip you you know what i mean and she'd have a sweet line like you'd be happy that she pistol whipped you yeah yeah like mm -hmm. ow ow good point though but ow <laughs> <laughs> it, and that leads to, from there, who is it then of these guest stars would be most willing to help you then go hide the body if you're on their team and they ha and, and you had murdered someone? Who on there, Who which one of these characters you're looking at, like, they would help me go hide the body and probably be able to make it successful? I think I'm going Jimmy Smith's on this one. Really? Um, I think he has <laughs> the right type of connections to help me hide a body. <laughs> um, or I'd be able to hide I his mean... own body. <laughs> 
<laughs> uh-huh. yeah, he pretty easily hid from his own body there in the beginning. Uh-huh. All right. Uh-huh. Wow, I'm like that's a total John Turturro for me. He mm. seems absolutely like the kind of guy who knows wh- exactly where to put a body. He's got <laughs> the setup in his trunk and everything. He's ready. This is where I'm gonna I'm gonna pull one here that you guys are gonna be upset about. But I'm going Sam McMurray who played no! Jimbo, the hotel's lone. Em- he was the lone employee of that hotel. <laughs> that man can make anything happen. You want bodies disappearing? You want you want to lose a boat? A, a, a tanker he will make it happen he's got the connections to make that happen and he'll bring you your morning paper <laughs> <laughs> he's already uh, making uh, breakfast for you anyway <laughs> you might as well, well invite uh, him in so who who would you say is the most helpful of the two either sam murray jimbo the hotel's lone employee or glenn fry's jimmy cole that's true because glenn fry he's like in that in that episode, he's like, "I'm not going to help you," and then he comes running in with a semi-automatic gun and just starts mowing people down. Right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And then he turns out for the rest of the show, he's their only backup. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, he. Yeah, you know, I I think that that would be my answer to to the next question. Be like, mo- like who would be most likely to be your stalker? And I think that that's Jim. Uh-huh. That he. He's stalking you, not Jimmy, but um, what's, Glenn yeah. Fry, yeah, yeah, Jimmy Cole, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's most likely to yeah. be Glenn Fry in, in his character from that episode. It's like that's the only way he was that laid back, right? So he wasn't really that laid back because he was watching you from the bushes the entire time. <laughs> <laughs> Jenna, you have thoughts on who from this list you would think you would walk outside and you would see in a car on the opposite street all of a sudden flip on its lights and drive away? (laughs) I mean, that for me is, oh, this is so hard. That's maybe Sam McMurray for me because the guy's got (laughs) to get his information somehow. I imagine that he just never sleeps. (laughs) He's like, the only way that he's not everywhere is that he ha- like he pays the island children to just bring him secrets <laughs> a la game of thrones like he just like pays them for them to go deliver his secrets okay but i've got one for you because i think that there- there's a there's a, a subtle tie in here but who do you think who do you guys think most likely to cuddle <laughs> because i gotta be honest for me that's glenn fry all the way okay glenn mm. fry is he's making the scrapbook mm-hmm. with with him and I, I'm gonna surprise you. I, I'm gonna surprise you. I think Ed O'Neill is mm, most likely to cuddle. Ooh. Yeah, he wants yeah. to cuddle. And he, he just seems like a cuddler cuddle. to me. <laughs> he, needs he needs it too. It. He's just he's so sad and overworked. He just needs someone mm-hmm. to hold him and tell him everything is gonna be okay. We sure it's not Burt Young? Yeah, I mean, especially after <laughs> witness protection. Yeah. <laughs> See, I would say this is where William Russ would come in as Evan. That he's I, he strikes me as someone who would lay with you and stroke his fingers through your hair, and he would be able to calm you down. <laughs> All right, guys, let's do one last question here on our on our guest stars from season one. Is who would be who would you choose out of these people? It's like if if we had to add another vice team and we wanted them to work as police officers on our vice team, who of these people w- w- would you pick? Jenna, who who would you pick from, from our list of great guest stars that would be a new vice team? Okay, well, so here's where I'm torn, right? Because the, like, the obviously useful choice is sam mcmurray because he's just gonna he's gonna get shit done right but like where my heart is is with william russ Mm, mm -hmm. because i think that he's the perfect addition like i i yeah i i wish he was still here (laughs) so i'm my answer is not has nothing to do with the characters they played on the show currently but with the actors who played them i would want either bruce willis or ving rames or possibly both as a partner team Ooh, mm. that'd be good. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Because I think that would just be outstanding. I mean, Buck Buck and Ving Rames. I mean, we already um, know that they're so useful together. I just think if that was the dynamic of moonlighting, it would still be on TV today. <laughs> Well, I'll say if I'm building a team is that would 
compete with my with the screen time of the B team. I would choose Adolfo Quiones, who played Pepe and is also from Breakin, along with Mark Lynn Baker as Bonzo Barry to build my backup to the B team. <laughs> I think my honorable mention, I think my honorable mention would be putting to T- John Turturro and Pam Greer together. Oh, they would get so much done. Yeah, they would actually be solving that would crimes, be a not yeah, murdering everyone. That's, that, that, that's uh, actually like a functional police unit. <laughs> I think, we, I think as we wrap up this section on all of our favorite people from season one, I think we can all take a moment and acknowledge that Sam McMurray is by far our MVP. Oh, yes. And we, we wish she would make more appearances as the helpful bellhop slash chef slash hotel clerk slash, slash bartender bart- slash drug dealer slash <laughs> <laughs> you will just see him more often. Come Let's back m- to us, Jimbo. <laughs> Let's move on and get and start talking about our favorite favorite music from season one because there's there's some great music scenes that happened in season one all right guys i think in this one we have less of a you know we'll keep it more free flow just kind of run through some of the best scenes from each episode that had music give a little opinion on on those scenes on how we thought them add it all up at the end and finally fess up to the songs that we've since we've seen it on Miami Vice, has now have a regular rotation in our Spotify playlist. So I just want to lay this out, right? Because for me, for the music, and and let me know, I, I guess, just so side note, let me know if this is not a format that we want to, to go with. So for me, the music started out so strong. All night long from Lionel Richie and In the Air Tonight, not only are those two of like my favorite songs, but they're like iconic mm-hmm. moments for, for, for the season. Like started it off on a strong note damn right most repetitive song for me was maybe bad to the bone and nobody <laughs> lives forever because it was in like every single scene <laughs> and i will say that the what is what was the song when they oh you look wonderful tonight crockett and gina finally finally hook up I figured that was gonna be <sighs> high on your list jenna as being one of the one of the, the key moments in the first season of season one is that scene on the boat with crockett and gina it's just yes 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 and you're right it starts off so strong you know like i can mention we have phil collins and lionel richie we get to the hit list and there's the bar fight scene where they're playing tush by zuzi top which i think john you talked about at that time like kind of seemed out of place because that's not where it should have been but right in the episode right Mm -hmm. after that we have a great that episode we had like that 15 minute opening segment where we have the long boat montage when Tubbs and crockett are racing in the boat out to st andrews they're playing voices by russ ballard which i say is not a famous a song but that scene is just it's miami vice especially with tubs just screaming at the top of his lungs <laughs> as they're going across the ocean <laughs> true very true and john i think by the time we get to eight where we have stay stay with me by teddy pendergrass you really settled in on giving us the great music rundowns that we are so used to now by the end of the first season yeah i i kind of really kind of settled into what what kind of research i needed to do and just kind of got into a, a nice groove with it. Of course, Pendergrass being amazing, but I do want to just take a brief step aside, and one of my favorite music scenes is Philip Michael Thomas singing his own <laughs> song. Uh, entering the maze. I uh, just want to let everybody know I have set up a GoFundMe account to, con- <laughs> to, to continue the career of Philip Michael Thomas's music, uh, to continue his music career. Career. So <laughs> please visit there and please donate, and we're going to get him back touring uh, by the end of this podcast. <laughs> We should really play a Sarah McLaughlin song right here. <laughs> I know that in the future we're gonna have more music from from Miami Vice actors, and I just after Philip Michael Thomas's song, it's like I'm so happy that we're gonna be getting more Vice singing. I don't know. Mm-hmm. I feel like that one performed poorly. <laughs> I, I am just looking forward to hearing Crockett's album, so I can compare that to Philip Michael Thomas's Don Johnson's album, which should yeah. drop next season. Oh, totally. Uh, uh, so that way I can try and decipher why Philip Michael Thomas's wasn't successful, but Don Johnson's was. And why Philip Michael Thomas continued to make music, but Don Johnson didn't. 
<laughs> yes. Yes. Well, Jenna, I think there's another one in here that is, even though you may not be a fan of the song, but a fan of the scene, which is in episode 14, go, the first part of Golden Triangle, when Croc is sitting poolside dressed as a nerd and Great Balls of Fire <gasps> by, Do- by Dolly Parton is playing. I'm fanning myself. <laughs> that pocket protector <laughs> just does things for me. <laughs> You're right. That that was that was a highlight moment for me, and I've got one for you. Because I know that this was like, this was a peak Dominic, okay? And it's episode 17, Rites of Passage, when Diane gets killed. Uh, <laughs> and we get, I don't want to know what love is, by uh, uh, I can't, I can't get enough of that scene. I mean, I just think back to, like, Crockett had to make that phone call and and valerie and tubs where where they, things are just starting to go right in their life and they thought they had solved the, oh i can't do it guys i can't do it <laughs> that is the true song. that might <laughs> actually be like one of the most watchable scenes like actually good not even just good music but like good all around <laughs> you know i i love that scene and i loved i actually loved that episode and i think that's when we really settled in on tubs and, and how much we were really loving him i i I think one of the most iconic scenes kind of was our introduction to the music was the driving montage within the air tonight oh absolutely Mm -hmm. and i mean what song had greater influence than glenn fry's smugglers blues which (laughs) as we know they actually wrote the episode after (laughs) after the music video <laughs> That's caught me so off guard that they that the whole episode wasn't like that they wanted to squeeze the song in because of a partnership that they actually heard the song and decided like we should make a whole episode about this. Thanks, Miguel Pinero. <laughs> uh, I think we could probably agree that the weirdest was wasn't the weirdest tush was easy top wasn't that the one john that you said the uh the chipmunks redid <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> oh, oh yes. no no it was legs no that was legs it was that legs. was legs <laughs> yes just so that we don't leave without feeling at least a little creepy the the music scene that stands out to me the most other than i want to know what love is which is it's just too much <laughs> is when we all got to know castillo a little better when catch the wind is playing by the blues project which isn't much of a song but we have the great scene of castillo in a speedo swimming in the ocean thinking about his missing wife that what mustache will never leave my memory. <laughs> I just I wanted feel to like keep, we keep... can't do this segment justice without talking about some of the great inspirations behind the songs, like the song "Hit Me with Your Best Shot" by Pat <laughs> Benatar, whose writer came up with it after the pillow punching <laughs> therapy session. <laughs> I just it's I the think great I'm gonna... Canadian pillow therapy. <laughs> and I, I want to point out that song was also given out on a free CD as part of a Pizza Hut promotion. <laughs> so. I, I just you know we go back always to just how much Alvin and the Chipmunks means to Miami Vice, and I feel like I should go back yes. and listen to all these songs at two x speed. <laughs> that, that <way> <laughs> Hear, hear all of them as Alvin and Chipmunks. But there's, there's looking at this at the list of songs here. There's so many of them that are montages, right? We have the boat montage where they're driving, where they're going to St. Andrews. There's the driving montage in the pilot. There's a driving montage in Glades where they're driving, where they, they play it essentially the entire song. The montage of the kids in Nobody Lives Forever out causing problems on the road with Bad to the Bone playing. They just nailed the montage in this show, right? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And I love how they let the song play through all the way to the end. So it's like uncomfortably long montages. Jenna, if, if you're oh. looking at this list, go ahead. Sorry, but I, I also want to point out that, you know, lest we give all the credit to the primary singers, right? Like Some Guys Have All the Luck by Rod Stewart and the Great McCarthy um, or Self Control, originally sung by Laura Branigan. But... We got it through our wonderful house band. <laughs> that Miami Vice house band. Just don't don't forget, maybe we'll add them onto that Patreon or whatever you got going on because <laughs> they could probably use a handout, right? <laughs> or a real handout to our boy Peter Gabriel, the one and only mm. Roth Loutist. 
<laughs> He's not the only one. I pointed that out. I, I read you a list of the top ten. Okay, true, true. <laughs> well, Jenna, if if you're looking at this list, which one stands out to you as like it's your favorite, your favorite music scene? So song and scene, you you put them both together. Which one stands out the most to you from season one? Hmm, I might have to go. Just I might have to go back to the beginning with all night long, Lionel mm. Richie, because that was iconic for me in that like it gave it was that great like flashback walk through the crowd and really introduces who rico is and what he's after and it's so fun and everyone and just looks so happy yeah and it's the house band it's not lionel richie performing it right yeah, the house band is performing yeah, it it's the house band so mm -hmm. i i mean that for me just started us off on such a strong foot that i i'm gonna give it to him you know i would say it's no secret what i'm gonna say is that i want to know what love is by foreigner in the rites of passage episode and that seat just it just speaks to me on so many levels <laughs> I, I don't want to I, I don't want to live through it again but I, I just i really enjoyed that scene so jo john john <clears throat> john what was your if you picked out one what is your favorite from this season being the person that does the music segments i really want to say live in the book of of my life by Philip michael <laughs> thomas just because it allowed me to just make so much fun of him and to remind everyone that it wasn't considered a, set, a success and made very little money um, <laughs> so like i just I, I i just had so much fun in that music segment that's probably one of the segments i had the hardest time keeping it straight you know without <laughs> just breaking in the laughter so uh, okay so then now it's honesty time guys honesty time what song from this season did you hear and then i've secretly been it's been on repeat on your spotify list you've downloaded it you've added it it's, it's if i looked in your youtube history there it is right at the top john let, let, let's start with you what's what song in here is your secret one that you've been hiding from us that you really really love now so i think i think i have two of them that i've kind of probably made obvious being we gotta get out of this place by the animals and lunatic fringe i just i even when i was doing this segment i was kind of singing along to those songs in my head <laughs> but i think the one that would probably surprise you guys or i would consider embarrassing is i i've been definitely listening to relax by frankie uh <laughs> frankie goes to hollywood a lot more than i probably ever have <laughs> <laughs> well john you're not alone. <laughs> I have also been listening to Relax much, much more than I ever have, though I was familiar with the song and Frankie Goes to Hollywood before we were introduced to it in Little Prince. So it's definitely not new on my playlist. Being an 80s fanatic in middle school, I had a bunch of these songs already, but Relax has definitely risen back up on the charts. Probably the one that I don't, I feel not great about and we've already referenced is the the alvin and the chipmunks version of legs <laughs> <laughs> because i just had to hear it and it's uh, it's just so good i mean i would say john i i've been listening to lunatic fringe a lot lately and that is for sure up there and so is i want to know what love is but those two they, they came up they're a flash in the pan they came back and i listened to them without fail Every week, you get me on a Saturday night, 1 a.m. on a Saturday night after we watched our, our bad movie of the week. You're going to go our lovable Canadian, aren't you? I am immediately at In the Air Tonight with Phil, by Phil Collins. <laughs> yes. Immediately. I cannot yeah. stop myself. And he was just recently on, was that Fallon? Where he did, because he has a new book coming out, and he performed with The Roots on stage. And he did In the Air Tonight. What? And, and, and I was just... Things have never been better. I just love Bill Collins <laughs> so much. And that song so much. It was just so great in the episode. I just love, I can't get enough of Bill Collins. And, and, and I can't hide from the general mass anymore my supreme love of Bill Collins. He is by far the winner of, of the Miami Vice season one music, I think. <laughs> Even Although, if others have taken my attention. I just, I do, I love him so much. Yeah, and like I said, Lunatic Fringe, though, has been on, that, that, that's still around. I 
still gets played every once in a while, especially because of yeah. not going to hide my love of wrestling movies either. And that happens to be in one of my favorite 80s movies in Vision Quest. So, yes, Vision <laughs> Quest. <laughs> Go home. <laughs> How the hell did I end up in this? <laughs> And that's going to do it for us this week on this, our season one rundown of the best people in music from season one. We we covered a lot of stuff. There's so many great things that happened in season one. We're going to be back next week with our with our second rundown of season one, where we focus on things, our best moments from season one, our, some of our other favorites from things that we thought were going to happen trends that were going to happen just point out all the fun that we had in season one and give kind of a clip rundown of all of our best moments we're going to have an exclusive episode just about jan hammer so i cannot wait to hear how much alvin and the chipmunks jan <laughs> hammer music there is out there you think that they did pillow fights before before they before jan hammer led whatever orchestra was playing <laughs> that's gonna do it for us this week i Be just sure wonder to- if there's a murder mystery mixed in somewhere <laughs> <laughs> that's gonna do it for us this week we hope you enjoyed this episode be sure to come back next week uh when we give our conclusion of season one and stay tuned to keep to hear the our rundown and all the history behind jan hammer and our jan hammer spectacular so that's gonna do it for us this week we hope you enjoyed this episode be sure to check out our website go with the com. we'd love to hear from you you can get us on twitter or facebook or email us go with the heat at gmail.com you can find our show on the regular rss itunes google play we're putting them up on youtube so you can pretty much find us anywhere we hope you enjoyed this episode and we'll see y'all next week bye pals see you next week